We're here at Fuji Farm at the listening room with uh, this conversation with Maestro James Jordan, Dr. James Jordan from Westminster Choir, uh, Saints, uh, Same Stream Choir as well, and so many other generative efforts. And uh, it's a privilege to have you here. The last day that this painting is here, <laughs> it's about to be shipped to Porter Museum for the summer exhibit this July. And uh, we just wanted to capture uh, this conversation which started, when, when was it that you, you, you brought your students here? Last September. Last September, right. Yeah. And we were in Oxford before then. Yeah, that's right. And then they came because I had done a painting, that's right, of that. That the was Lutkin, a Lutkin piece. Yes. And students like, you know, the Watch see that. Yeah. The so we, had, we had how many students here? 30? 40. Close 40. to 40. Oh my gosh, 40 students. Packed. And I said something like, well, you won't see this painting for a while. So it's, you know, I started to talk. All right. And then what was your experience? Well, the reason we're here is because that, uh, the choir gathered in this room and uh, I was in that corner. And mm -hmm. uh, Mako started talking about perception and seeing in the way that he does. And... Um, while he was talking, I mean, you can see the painting. The painting looks like blue. It's blueberries. It's called blueberries. <laughs> it's called blueberries. <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, this is fine. And I'm standing in that corner, and I am just, I'm not staring at the painting. I'm mm -hmm. looking at it. There's a difference, I think. Mm -hmm. And things started to appear out of the painting. Mm -hmm. I started to see waves of different color. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then he's talking about, um, you know, and he'll, he'll tell you about what happens in the eye. And then this kind of wreaked havoc with my students and my conducting students because <laughs> it's a metaphor. So mm -hmm. I'm approaching this as a, as a musician, and that's why we're doing this. But I do think what happened is not only a neurological happening, mm -hmm. but I think we just slowed ourselves down to the point where we could perceive something. And this is this is the slower thing you've been talking about for years that I have started to use in my writing and my conducting, but mm -hmm. slowing down so that you can perceive, there's a common ground between perceiving art and perceiving sound. Mm -hmm. And so I've used this and I've written about it in the book that you'll see in the, the yes. notes. It's, yes. it's, it's called Listen Loud. And what I want musicians to understand is how do we listen yeah. listen i think is like when people say truth and beauty yeah you can't argue those terms but what are they yeah and then yeah. when you say listen okay i get that but what mm -hmm. is listening what is mm -hmm. seeing mm -hmm. i think seeing mm -hmm. and listening occupy the same stratified air mm -hmm. uh, in terms of our perception so it's thanks to you you've created a, a, quite a mess um, in terms of, but I think the metaphor of you, not only this painting, but your artwork in yeah. general, we don't, in this world, we don't know how to proceed. Yeah. And, and musicians need to learn how to listen by slowing down. Yeah. Because music is slow motion. It's mm -hmm. slow motion text. It's slow mm -hmm. motion sound. And if you're functioning at the rate we live, you're not, you're not, I don't think you're going to perceive anything. Yeah. And there's a lot of silence as well. Now, we have noticed, uh, as and I will watch you conduct, um, it, it's just absolutely mesmerizing to watch you because there's some ways that you connect. Um, you talked about this invisible thread that conductors have with their singers and so forth. But talk a little bit about, as a conductor, that experience of slowing down, what that means for you personally. It's, it's all through breath. Mm -hmm. That The breath is the key to, to slowing the metabolism. And I think you don't consciously say, I'm slowing down. But, the, but if you breathe, mm -hmm. that is what people connect with. It's not necessarily what I'm doing with my hands. What I'm doing is moving sound forward. But this human connection of breathing with other people, which was my teacher's number one. Well, we spent a whole year on breathing. At the age of 21, I thought, what are you doing, crazy woman? Elaine Brown was my teacher. 
and and that was what John Finley Williamson taught at Westminster Choir College. It's mm -hmm. a, it's about breathing. So mm -hmm. that process. But let me add something else. So Westminster Choir just got done with uh, two very long recording sessions in different places. One mm -hmm. one on campus and one in New York. And I love recording because recording forces you to slow down. You're doing a take after a take where you are you are made to stay in a zone. And what I found out, and, and that's why I came to talk with you and then this mm. video comes out, mm. I realized that in those recording sessions, as I, as I slowed, I heard more. Mm. I, things were coming out of the score that in normal life, I, in an hour and a half rehearsal, we're putting stuff together and then yeah. we walk out the door. But when you're in three and a half hours of recording a piece mm -hmm. and the choir is, there's very little talking going on. I found myself almost like looking at this painting. Mm -hmm. Things were coming out of the score that I had never mm -hmm. realized. And I've been looking at the same, it's just the same ink. Yeah. And so yeah. I started then again thinking about this painting and that experience of slowing down to see and that they are... They are the same experience. It's, yeah. a, it's just different media. It's amazing how uh, you know art has this generative kind of in, uh, way that even for me, I want my art to speak. And I want to be listening when I'm painting. Um, and we talked a little bit about my father's research as a leading speech and hearing scientist and how he would sit in front of my painting for, for literally hours. And he, he would talk to me about that as, as if it was a listening experience for him that, you know, he loved music. And so it, this connection is really a complex, connection if you understand the how how the optic nerve and you know um, all the back of the brain uh, works but at the same time there's this overlap between singing and, and when you say breathing it resonated with me because I feel like the breath is everything that I'm trying to do in my art is, is, is to is to capture that breath of life you know in, embedded in the paintings and um, so for you then 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 act of reading a, a, a composed piece and, and then this this coming alive uh, with your singers is is always new right it's, it's kind of a generative well, let me just say about this, that you gave a lecture in Oxford maybe three years ago. Mm -hmm. There are conductors where the piece is not always new. The mm -hmm. objective is to make the piece the same. Exactly, yeah. And I think that's safe in a way. Mm -hmm. It's a controlling of the media. Mm -hmm. It's like you say, I'm going to paint the same painting every time oh, I paint. Yeah. And you could do that, I theoretically. Think, yeah. <laughs> but, but this this process of making new things new, right. new newness, your yeah. phrase, which I've used and stolen, frankly, <laughs> but credited you always. <laughs> but the idea of new newness um, yeah. ha requires one to slow down. The mm -hmm. other thing is, mm -hmm. neither you or I are neurologists, nor do mm -hmm. we claim to be or play one on television. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we do perceive what's going on while we're doing what we're doing. For example, when you describe the cones in the eyes and they mm. have take time to adjust. Now, I don't know about art, visual art, but I do know that it will, I don't know if we'll ever understand how, how sound is processed, how I can have an image for what I've studied in the background while I hear a live performance in front of me. I don't, and then that, mm -hmm. I don't care. I don't care to know yeah. the neurology. All I know is it happens. It happens, yeah. Here, a question I wanted to ask you in the yeah. next. So, so I've watched some videos of you mm -hmm. in your studio and you're mm -hmm. painting and you're using, mm -hmm. sometimes you use a brush and sometimes mm -hmm. you use a, a, a spray. Yeah. Do you hold your breath when you're painting? 
You're supposed to. Yeah, that's one of the things that you learn very early on in drawing a single line is you, you're supposed to hold your breath. Now, for me, that I can do that, but I've learned over the years that it's kind of, you know, you, you have rules so you can break them. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and so, yes. And so you, you start the experiment with what happens if, if I am breathing. And many of these paintings, actually, this, this work is completely monochromatic if, when you come into the room. Uh, it's gray, it's a little bit bluish gray, and you cannot capture it on digital media because it just, the media, it's, the camera will flatten it even yes. further, right? But the human eye can see the breath. And so I, in this work, I'm literally consciously like breathing because it's the opposite of that, what you yes. talked about, um, particularity of, of a composed piece being played over and over in the same way. I am actually limiting, creating boundaries around even what I paint. You know, I don't draw a line with a whole breath, but I am letting the breath itself be the surface. So that, that it's kind of the opposite of um, what I learned to do. Yeah. So the other thing that I, I really want, especially musicians to hear, the most shocking thing I've ever heard you say is this, and there's many good <laughs> shocking things uh, that made me think, but you, this is a number of years ago, you had come to Westminster and somebody asked you to give a, a lecture mm -hmm. to the sacred music folks in the evening. Mm -hmm. and, um, Somebody, some, yeah, somebody, yeah, it was on Kintsugi, but somebody asked you, when you paint, how long do you paint each day, and what's your process? And, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> but I always thought, okay, well, he's a painter, so what he does is he squeezes stuff out of tubes, mm. and he uses a brush, mm. and then you mm. said, no, I, I, I mix everything, I'm mm. using minerals, mm. and it, I have to, it, it's a process in which mm -hmm. I slow down till I'm ready to paint and I'm gonna substitute the word, mm -hmm. perceive what you're about to do. Mm -hmm. That was, mm -hmm. that was my first introduction into slowing down, mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. slow art. And you had, you had even mentioned you like it because it, mm -hmm. it, it puts you in a place where you can create. Yeah, yeah so <clears throat> in order to prepare oyster shell or even this material, which is a, very smoky, azurite, finely pulverized. You have to mix it like three days before you actually paint because the consistency that I'm after requires the, um, the glue, Mikawa glue to settle a little bit and in mortar and pestle and so forth, you're adjusting. So the whole process, so, you know, so those three days, I am basically painting, right? But preparing to, but you know, actual execution, maybe that just, just just that one stroke. Um, you know, actual execution may only take a second, but you're really preparing your heart, your mind, and your soul to that place. And so it, it, it you know, it is an interesting, when students ask me questions, Sometimes I'm, I I don't even know what I'm saying. You know, I'm just right. saying, saying what I'm saying. And then later on, I was like, oh, that's true. You know, like I actually am painting all the time because I know the slowness of preparation. And even when I'm traveling, right, that, that, that means I can let certain pigments settle in, in a bowl for two weeks. And then when I come back, you know, it's completely dry. And that is different than, let's say, preparing for, you know, preparing for three days. Wow. <laughs> okay. The other thing that I did want to ask is that I heard a couple of times that you've talked about, and in fact, when we were here, mm -hmm. there was that particular painting where uh, you had painted it, but things started to emerge after you painted yes. it. Oh, yes, three and, years later sometimes, yeah. Okay, so later. what this does for me for musicians mm -hmm. is, you know, music, I think, scores emerge to us if we, mm -hmm. if we stop controlling and we, we, we kind of do things mm -hmm. in an honest way. But this whole thing about all of a sudden an image emerges mm -hmm. that you did not 
plan. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something about that metaphor yeah. for musicians that you don't make the image when you're painting it, right. but somehow you it emerges. And, and it's like a uh, wine maker making good wine, right? You, you, ne you don't really know like if this you know, wine is going to be a good wine in <laughs> right. 10 years, but you do know. Right, that's that's the knowledge of, of a winemaker, and I I am in a sense in control of that you know ever evolving image, but but then I'm not, and I think it's it's about the presence that you you are able to create that sense of presence uh, in a moment that you are actually executing the painting but you're thinking about a different notion of time it it's not about executing it's about beholding it's about listening it's about being able to let go of your control over it and i have increasingly in my recent works the works that are going to Porto museum in in japan are paintings that are particularly about that it's about listening one is called walking water which uh, you, you might have seen images of but it's it's an image that i painted outside here and and then then i will listen to it because it's a, also a collaboration with Susie barra the visionary composer yeah. and percussionist too so i i have been really you know journeying with this notion of listening when you when you talk about the title of your book, This uh, and Loud, or, you know, or whatever that may become, that um, is exactly what this work is about. It, it's about not painting, you know, you know in a sense, um, the, the colors are limited, it's, a, it's only one type of pigment, it's, it's like strokes are limited, there's no line, but can it express the fullness of human emotion? in the same, same way that Rothko talked about, um, the impact that work of art can have in one's soul, you know? And, and so, and, and when, when I have heard so many of the renditions, um, and, and especially the Lutkin benediction that you were kind enough to share with us, um, with, with your group, and, uh, and I, I connected the, that, experience with kind of what I'm doing in the studio mm -hmm. and so it, it's a vicarious <laughs> kind of stealing I guess you know you you, you, yeah. you we're always between artists we're always um, trying to get at the mystery of it you know and you do your uh, singers uh, I'm doing it with my pigments but but it, it seems to me that there's, there's just such power in us coming together and talking about it because that that's that's the piece that a lot of people don't realize right that people don't realize like you conducting this beautiful choir piece and me painting my studio there, there's there's a connection well the word you used that just jumped out at me which i am going to use okay <laughs> there is a beholding process yes, yes i mean that's a beautiful word the job of a conductor is to behold, mm -hmm. not to not to control, not to, and that process of, mm -hmm. of learning a score. It, your process as a conductor is to behold mm -hmm. in the sound that's in the room. Yeah, I mean, I would also say that, you know, the conductors that do this, it's very clear to the ear. My my mm -hmm. friend and, and mm -hmm. Donald Malley, who is doing this incredible mm -hmm. work with the crossing. It's every every piece is brand new. Every piece is new newness, mm -hmm. and to conduct it each way so that it continues to um, cause the audience to behold mm -hmm. things in mm -hmm. text mm -hmm. and word. Um, mm -hmm. It's becoming at this. I think you know there is an advantage to being um, yeah. advanced age in your profession <laughs> because <laughs> you make decisions on what just isn't important anymore. And what is important in terms, especially if you're going to put things, you're putting things to canvas and I'm putting things to recording. Yes. And if it, it, you can make a recording, mm -hmm. 
but sound that people can behold things mm -hmm. is is like this painting. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to give it time to have an effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you do, I think it's it's remarkable. But this just I'm just telling you, this created in my mind a mess. Yes. A mess of, <laughs> of understanding, a beautiful mess. <laughs> um, and it is, it, I mean, you, no one watching this video can uh, look at it and say, well, it looks like you just painted the wall. Yeah. It, 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 if you're here and you sit in this room with the sun coming in and the light changing and you keep looking, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. your mind starts to really behold things that are, mm -hmm. that are, mm -hmm beneath the obvious surface. And yeah, that's, there's 200 layers. So. There's 200 <laughs> layers. So, <laughs> so, so what I want the conductors to understand is yeah. that our, our music making has as many layers. Yes. Oh, it's yes. just not the pitch and the rhythm. Right. It's it's other things. And, and yeah. I'm trying to figure out a way because my graduate students are frustrated. Uh, they want to know, what are they listening to? Right. And they're not, you study, you think, you process. Mm -hmm. But in the moment, you don't hear what you're about to... You, mm -hmm. There's some predictive that mm -hmm. you're aware that something mm -hmm. familiar is mm -hmm. going to happen. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's a process of familiarity. Yeah. But, but beyond that, I, I just want them to not control yeah. and yeah. to be more spontaneous and to trust what goes on in this yeah. thing yeah. of ours. Yeah. So, so you, you were there, I think, one of the earliest um, Kintsugi workshops that we held in Princeton yes. <laughs> and it was a kind of an experiment. You came into the room, I remember, early and sat and watched all these people come in and, and the idea of Kintsugi experience now is to behold, right, to develop the faculty of beholding. But back then I, I didn't know what, what this was about. But you, you helped me tremendously because um, afterwards, you, you, you shared with me actually what you were observing and beholding because you, that's what you do. And you, as a conductor, you were like seeing every person, a total strangers, come into the room, a father and a daughter, you know, uh, and, yeah. uh, a former engineer, uh, really unsure, like, should I be in this room? You know, why, why am I doing this art, the craft? Um, and and uh, it, it was actually astonishing what the power of your observational skills and in reading the nonverbal cues. <laughs> I don't know if you're aware of this. Well, I was, <laughs> because I was very fascinated. I mean, in hindsight, wouldn't it have been great to have a secret camera yeah. recording how every person interacted with that broken piece of pottery? Yeah. That was, to me, the thing I told told you that I thought was fascinating. Everybody, so you brought some pottery that right that, from your mother. I did. Yes. Okay, which yeah. that that had a very kind of sacred, and yeah. it was interesting who wanted yeah. to work on that yeah. and who did not. Right. So that's the first. Oh wow. And yes. then the other thing that happened was there was the gentleman who went to Target. Yes. If you remember, and yeah. bought a pot. Yes. And then broke it. Yes. Just so he could do the, yes, right. and he thought it was about fixing a pot, right? And the way he <laughs> did it, and how quickly he did it, yeah. He, I wouldn't say he missed the point, but he missed the point. Mm. Then you had other people who chose a, a piece of pottery with only a small repair, and they took such care with it. Mm. And you had other people who, who were mm. frustrated, like how fast would the glue dry, and mm. all that that thing. Mm -hmm. And I, mm -hmm. I just found it to be a very um, fascinating process as people came in um, and then there were some people that you know took great care yeah. in that reparation yeah. so yeah. Um, but well, I, I also find that, that with yeah. conductors they don't take care they they, they, they just want to get it mm -hmm. and that's it produce fix it and then present it yeah, yeah. 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 And and maybe we'll do that someday. We, we can have you, you know, put, put a microphone and video on you and observing, <laughs> just observing people doing kintsugi. Um, but you know, beholding I, I, the, is is probably one of the mis mystery pieces of, of this universe and certainly of our culture that is so driven to efficiency and fixing. <laughs> Um, and it's a hard discipline to teach 
right? So you, yeah. you're talking about your graduate students, you're talking about your singers, but um, have you experienced as a, as a conductor and teacher, people growing into that? Is it yes. still possible? Yes, it is, it is, but it also requires of me to stay in the same place all mm. the time and not get frustrated and give them the time they need. Mm. Um, and and creating a rehearsal environment for them. Or I think part of it is that they sing in the choir that they're in with me. I'm hoping that they're acquiring some slow art of their own, that, that it's about listening and it's about connecting with people. But I, I think it's a process. And I think it's directly, I hate to say it, but I think it's directly related to age and experience. Mm. I mean, the way you're... Well, you're, the way you're talking now, if I met you on the campus of Bucknell University as a 20-something, I don't think you'd be talking this way. Yeah, we, I, I had a hint of that, but I never realized that, yeah, 40 years later, I mean, you, you see a painting here, you see a painting when I did it when I, I was know. three. Yeah, and I, I don't know, you know, if, if, if the conversation, this conversation, which seems sacred to me, you know, if you were to p press time as 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 a you know Kairos time or not Chronos, so it's not linear, yeah. but it's pressed in in a present. Um, that that there will be all sorts of I'm sure inclinations and intimations that comes out later, but but then you have no idea, and that's that's what it's amazing about. Um, singing because everybody can sing basically yes. you know my father believed that uh as an acoustics researcher that it, it's just a matter it's, it is about breathing and breathing well right breathing yes. with attentiveness to your voice and so that you know going back to what no years i i i had an intimation of that but i couldn't really no i don't that. think i don't think yeah. at that age either i i yeah. I had a great teacher who was, Elaine was patient with me in that she laid, it was sort of like breadcrumbs. Yeah. She laid out all the crumbs and she laid out the path and was assistant that I listen. Yeah. I don't think I was always hearing. Yeah. And I think um, she did it in such a way that it embedded itself. The, the most important principles embedded themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah. you know, and now I, it, yeah, it's, it is, a, it, it's the gift of my life, basically, yeah. that I keep yeah. coming back to Elaine yeah. and, and how she, it would be interesting if she could be alive to sit in this room and talk with us yeah. um, in at this place yeah. time, but I think the message would still be the same. But I do love, for everybody listening uh, and watching, um, it is, we stumbled on the word beholding. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so final question. Um, what are your dreams? For the future, what what do you want to accomplish in the next couple of years, other than this book? Well, I I find it exciting that through my students and their questions, I'm not afraid of questions anymore. And when there's a question, I was taught by my other teacher at Gordon that you listen to the question because there's always legitimacy, mm -hmm. and and it's it's both frustration that. And there are things you think you thought, taught them well and you didn't. Um, I I don't know. I think, like with you, each painting is another experience. I'm looking at repertoire for next year. I don't hmm. um, I have curiosities. Um, and I think it's, I don't set goals, but I do find there's an organic unfolding that happens with each year now. I don't, when I program for the choir, for example, the CD that we recorded yeah. last year, Serenity of Soul, started with one piece and it, it kind of grew mm. because something happened to me. That piece relates or that relates mm. or our experience of the group of people, I have to know the group of people that's in the room. Mm. Um, you know, I, I also... You know, I worry about Westminster Choir College. I mean, if you ask me what I hope to achieve is that it sustained itself mm. in mm. in like any art form. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. that I don't have control over. Right. All I can all I can do is continue to do what we do. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And and I love 
as you do, thinking about big ideas and, and trying to understand what we're doing. I mean, I, I'm, I'm yeah. caught because I, I think that's anyone's legacy to try to explain. I, I think in music, the pedagogy of what we've done, we have no pedagogy of conducting. I don't think there's been any pedagogy of painting, except, no. for example, when Mark Rothko writes down mm -hmm. that nobody paid attention to. Right, right. right. Well, he didn't even know. He didn't even know. <laughs> yeah. And so, so it, for me, the writing, I think I've gone a little bit overboard with mm. 60 books. But, <laughs> but the, the wanting to not waste time with young artists to not have them go through a discovery process that I've already been through. Yeah, yeah. And also yeah. to give them, see, I think the C.S. Lewis idea of metaphor, mm. I used to try to explain things. Mm. I wanted to explain everything because mm. like, part mm. of me is a music psychologist. And sometimes as C.S. Lewis said, you can't explain, you can only use metaphor, which Tolkien mm. used right. all the time. Right. So this Creative. is a metaphor yeah. for me. For mm -hmm. my students to take mm -hmm. them out of sound and say, okay, this is this is this process and how similar is it to what we do? Mm -hmm. And it is. It's mm -hmm. very similar. Mm -hmm. So if you ask me what I want to do, just try to answer some more questions. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, yeah. I, they keep cropping up, unfortunately. Yeah. But, um, and, 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 yeah. but that's why I found your work so tremendously exciting and also the way uh, you you talk about you have a wordsmithing ability mm. to, and you know the other thing I wanted wanted to say is that, you know, people read your writing and say, well, he's kind of, kind of dealing with theology here. He's talking about this and he's talking <laughs> about that, but, but there's a bigger issue here. Yes. There's a, a a divine force working in all mm -hmm. of us, and I mm -hmm. I don't read it as. Christian and I don't read mm -hmm. what you write. Mm -hmm. I read it as someone trying to make sense of of things. Yeah. And yeah. and we happen to be artists and so we yeah. I think we can behold things in a score that are beyond any a certain religion. Robert Shaw used to say, you know, when you do the B minor mass, <clears throat> he said, you, you, I don't want to hear your religiosity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He said, because, like, he used an example, and it's, it's on the internet in places where people said the crucifixus of the B minor mass is the greatest depiction sonically of the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. And he said, they're, they're wrong. Mm -hmm. What Bach wrote is the impact of that event mm -hmm. in sound upon all of mankind. Yes. It yeah. was not Martin Luther's viewpoint of the crucifixion, right. it was not right. Bach's viewpoint. That yes. it wasn't a painting of the crucifixion and sound, it was in sound mm -hmm. the impact upon a human life that mm -hmm. that, that sacrifice gave. Mm -hmm. Ave Verum Corpus mm -hmm. of Mozart mm -hmm. is that opening chord progression in the Mozart is to me the most incredible passage of sound that opens one mm -hmm. to give up oneself. I mean, mm -hmm. it's those bigger messages which mm -hmm. I think are hard to think about. Mm -hmm. And hard mm -hmm. to distill, but it's in the sound and it's in it's in paintings. Mm -hmm. So, wow. yeah. Well, thank you for yeah. giving wings to people, uh, including me, and um, as as we look forward to collaborating more. Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I hope our wings grow and uh, and and we, you know we we get to discover new. Vistas, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, so thank you so much. Well, thank you for your comments. Fantastic. Thank you.